Okay, well, let's get moving along. Uh, the, my next, uh, the next speaker, you know, usually it's hard to follow a talk like that, but uh, Dr. Grossman is the kind of guy that can follow a talk like that. He is tremendous. He's uh, a surgeon um, in Maine, really in like, a, a, it's just a, a, you know, community-based, academic-based surgeon uh, who for many, many years has been deeply interested in um, the intersection of technology and healthcare, particularly surgical care, uh, education, improving, um, uh, improving uh, flow in the operating room, improving skills of surgeons. Uh, he was the first surgeon in the world, I believe, was it in 2013, he's Google Glass in the operating room. So that's uh, what he was sort of a claim to fame and since then has become uh, sort of a futurist uh, who's grounded in reality at the same time uh, and is really a terrific speaker and I can't wait to hear what you get to share with us Thank today. You, Thanks so much for, for coming all the way from Maine. Thank all you. Right. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, great. Well, it's great to be here. I'm a, I'm a surgeon. As uh, Brian said, I, I, I do robotic surgery, advanced laparoscopy, and, and uh, trauma surgery. Most of what we do is trauma surgery, emergency surgery. You know, time is of essence. So uh, through time and stuff, we, I got into VR and MR, and I think myself as a, as, a, as, a, as a VR surgeon and as an MR surgeon. And, Maybe because of that, because it's very rapid surgeon and, uh, and uh, also muy rapido, because I'm from Venezuela originally. <laughs> so uh, uh, so my, uh, my, my, my career sort of as healthcare futurist started in, in Singularity University in the exponential medicine track. And uh, that's where I met uh, uh, Babak Parvis, the inventor of Google Glass. And uh, Babak uh, showed Google Glass and I was just completely amazed. When I saw the device, I thought, wow, this, this can really transform, you know, the, the way we, uh, we connect, the way we communicate uh, between providers, uh, with patients, uh, with families and whatnot. I uh, then uh, took it to the OR. I, I you know, asked for uh, forgiveness, not for permission, really, and I just did it. You got to be bold sometimes, and that uh, it took off, and uh, that really it was the beginning of a, of a very fun a, 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 a path uh, for me. A, uh, you know, I'm a surgeon, so the, this sort of setting is very common for me. This is the way we, we did it in the past, but it's not too different the way we do it right now. Um, uh, you know, I thought Google Glass would be a great tool to bring viewers, students, any interesting party to a procedure, to virtually be inside your head with your perspective, looking at what you are looking at, connected with you, with audio and video. So virtually bringing someone right next to you easing their path to learning, to, to, to uh, being experts, becoming experts uh, doing a procedure. So uh, you can think of Google Glass really as, as, as one of the first tools really uh, that, that we use to do AR. You know, it's really an, an augmented reality uh, tool, very simplistic in a way, but very complex in others. <laughs> it, it, it's not a new uh, concept, you know, if you think about this, uh, you know, I don't know, 25 years old or something, the first Terminator movie, you know. Hollywood always thinks about things uh, you know, ahead of time, you know, 20 years or so. So if you want to be a good uh, a, a, a healthcare futurist, you've got to watch a lot of sci-fi movies. Uh, these videos, for some reason, are not showing. But uh, anyways, this is how we do rounds today, you know, in a, in a very complex hospital, very digital, wired hospital and whatnot. We have a piece of paper with all the patients in there and you kind of look at all the info in the computer, you stand up and you go to the patient's room and try to take your notes. Despite all these tools that we have available, we still do this, this type of medicine that it's really prehistoric, you know, it, it's really shameful. You know? This is a video from uh, uh, Lucian Engelen from Radboud University in the Netherlands kind of showing the potential use of Google Glass, for example, to do rounds, to help us connect between ourselves with the patients, with clinicians that could be consultants for us, and at the same time with an electronic medical record, for example. So it's pretty intuitive. It's not really, uh, you know, something that, that, we, uh, that is hard to understand. I started blogging and, and created a web page, and I thought, that, you know, as a surgeon, my responsibility is with my patients. My passion it's my patients. I'm a full-time healthcare, you know, clinician, but also have the responsibility to be a, a sort of a preacher, an evangelist of sorts, to, to bring out this info to, to out there, to, to the patients, if not 
the patient is demanding a change, the change will not happen. So I really think that patients are one of the most important uh, uh, players, obviously. You know, healthcare is a human right, right? We all know that, we all have heard that, but we don't really treat it that way. Healthcare is really a very secondary thing for, for budgets and for, for people discussing important matters. And uh, healthcare is really in a shameful state. As you all know, the ones of you who, who really deal with healthcare, and we all do, from one end or the other, we're all have to do with healthcare, healthcare is in deep trouble. And in many, many countries in the world, you know, global health is a big problem, but in the US it's a shameful state. You know, we spend more than any other country and we are in one of the last spots for the quality of healthcare that we have overall. And that is a problem. There are many causes for that. But healthcare is really in trouble because of this, because the human connection, we have lost the human connection. We have lost that empathy between physician or provider and the patient. And this is where I think technology can really, really make a difference. You know, using technology in a different way, you know, innovating, creating, you know, being in a way disruptors, you know, a, a trying to, to, to really break paradigms and do things differently. And it's not just a saying, we have to do it, because if we don't do it, it will not happen. It's up to us to change, to build that future. So uh, Eric Topol's book, The Creative Destruction, you know, I call it a creative disruption. You know, it's really important that we do things differently. You know, this guy, you know, in the 70s, cell phone, you know, now we have, you know, cell phones that, that are, you know, exponentially better computers or even, you know, obviously phones than that device just a, a few years ago. Things are moving at a, at a very tremendous pace. You know, we have the, ten, the, the, the iPhone 10, you know, with face recognition, and we don't even know how we're going to use these devices. So in healthcare is one of the areas where these devices can really, really make a, a true difference. And uh, things are evolving. You know, I, I don't like to talk about revolutions because I'm from Venezuela originally, and that's a bad word for me. You know, it's a, a evolution. So it's evolution of the technology. So uh, the evolution of, you know, how we had computers filling up a big room to now computers that, you know, are in our pockets or in our heads or in our wrists, you know, or, our, or our, our fingers. So things are really evolving at a very, very uh, interesting pace. Uh, so scalpel, gloves, associated with surgeon, right? So we need to associate now tools like VR, like AR, like mixed reality. You know, is that possible? We all know what VR, AR, and MR is, and the concepts kind of intermix, and we're not going to discuss the, 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 the meaning, but you all understand what, what these terms uh, uh, mean, correct? So uh, I think that uh, in surgery specifically, and sometimes, I don't know why, so in sur surgery is very complex, very complicated. You know, you go to the OR, and I tell you, it's crowded, it's loud, it's busy, Everyone is in a foul mood sometimes, frequently. We use a lot of, you know, pretty, uh, pretty you know, technologies that are exponential, but everything is, there's no room for another device, seems like. So things are not that, that, that easy, you know. We, we already carry a bunch of gadgets, you know. We, we have, uh, you know, lamps, we have loops, we have uh, uh, suction devices, we have uh, all sorts of tools to make the surgery better. So to add another tool, imagine a viewer, to, to add a screen or some augmented reality pointer, it's, it's all very, very complicated and not easy to do. And I was going to say with that slide that, that you know, sometimes the, the field of, 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 uh, of interest is so minute, so microscopic, that it makes things much, much difficult. So you're all familiar with the cardboard. You're all familiar with the, with the, with the, with the trend that cardboards have, 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 have had in the last a few years. And, uh, you know, this is uh, a picture from uh, Shafi Ahmed, a good friend of mine, surgeon in London, you know, VR surgeon, amazing guy. He's a true, true pioneer. You know, they gave uh, VR viewers to a bunch of students and then decided to then connect students and the world inside the operating room by live streaming virtual reality. They did this in the OR in a real case with a two-minute delay, just for obvious reasons. And at the end of the surgery, 55,000 all over the world, 55,000 all over the world were inside that operating room with Shafi and his team learning how he did the surgery at London Royal Hospital. Imagine the potential of that to be a learning, a connecting tool. It's just amazing. They created this medical realities company. I, by the way, have no disclosures, but I'm, I'm one of the, the advisors, I guess. Or, I guess or, or, so it's a, it's a virtual reality platform using the simple tools to guide students to learn how to do surgery. And you interact with digital, virtual, augmented reality platforms and live feeds 
by using a simple cardboard, a phone that we all have in our pockets, and just an app. So again, it, it's really no limit to what we can, we can create. One of the first, uh, I'm going to go back, is one of the first uh, AR viewers at MIT, you know, one of those viewers that were so heavy they had to suspend it from the, from the ceiling, you know, to what we have now, which is basically, you know, untethered, you know. We all know the power of these tools to really immerse you, to have experiential learning, to embody it yourself in this. This is so real that if you haven't done it, you ought to. And probably, you, you, most likely all of you have tried uh, with VR, but the experience is so so the, something happens in the brain that we cannot really understand and you know things like you know skip and, and other uh, trying to, to to decipher what's going on in the brain when we do and how is the brain reacting to all this this input and i think that is just fascinating and has an incredible potential to improve things you know in general in surgery you know we're using this already all over the world in a few places but all over the world they're using this therapy this is in france using uncomfort which is a vr a platform similar to what uh, applied vr has and you know it's being used and again you know it improves the patient's anxiety it improves the patient's uh, requirement for for narcotics and analgesics you know it is real stuff it's not it's not uh, you know a, a, a science fiction like this and again back to science fiction you know, this is movies that you probably all watched years ago. We already do this. We already can do this. For years now, we've been able to then have this at home. Commercial devices. Commercial devices like, like the, the HoloLens, which I wanted to demo, but unfortunately, you know, I don't have time to do that. But if you haven't tried the HoloLens, it's an amazing platform to really try a hologram in front of you, a hologram that is not just there, a hologram that you can interact with. So the power of these tools is incredible. An old anatomy learning lab, not too different to the labs that we have right now, probably at Cedar sinai or at Stanford or UCSF or, you know, in Harvard. The same thing, a little dirtier maybe, but the same concept, you know. The death teaching the living, you know. Mortu vivos docent. And, and this is something that caught my mind when I saw this picture. This is a picture of my great-great-grandfather in Venezuela in the 1800s. He was an anatomy, you know, a surgeon, an anatomy professor. And uh, I want to share that with you. But, you know, again, the, the death teaching the living. So how can we make that different? And we should make that difference because we have now technology. And technology can really teach the living, you know, if we use it in a smart way. In the case of simulation, you know, we, we have incredible you know, a, a power now to transform that old surgical saying. You know, you see one, you do one, and you teach one. So see and teach. You can certainly transform this. But can we use virtual and augmented reality and mixed reality to, to do one? And that's sort of the depth of my talk. You know, is, is that possible? I think that we're getting there, but we're certainly not there yet. When you have devices like the HoloLens, where you can really recreate human anatomy, either fictional or real human anatomy, and have different people interact with these 3D holograms in a better way than you can in real life, that is pretty powerful. You have companies like Animaris, based in Bonn, in Germany, that I'm advising, and uh, they created a real heart. It doesn't bleed, but it tells you it's real. You feel it. You, in the, you know, it, the haptics are there. You can learn about the heart in a way that you could never do it before. I put it on patients, and the little old lady with AFib, she finally, she finally fe feels, you know, how AFib really, what the doctors mean when they say irregular heart rate. Even though the heart is in her, her, her chest, when she sees that, and later when I show you the, the, the phone platform, it's really, really a phenomenal learning tool. And it's an interactive learning tool. You have platforms like, uh, say, AE a, 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 a in France that let different users interact with an animated model, you know, making the learning experience something that we could never do before except in real delivery in this case. Perfectioning things before we actually go to the, to the real patient. Learning by mistakes, but not in the real human. So that is really, really very, very powerful. <coughs> you have immersive uh, a, a touch out there. You can try it in the back in here. And I got in contact with them a few weeks ago, and I was fascinated because it's not just the use of VR. It's not just the use of haptics. 
is also the possibility of getting real patient anatomy, real patient data from CTs, MRIs, radiologic studies into the VR picture and then practice on that patient, practice on that vertebra, on that spine, over and over and over before you open the patient's back and decreasing the errors, increasing your outcomes, improving your outcomes. This is pretty powerful. And again, this is the beginning. It's not happening quite yet in a way that we could clinically use it uh, in a day-to-day -day basis, but it will. Not just radiology, but ultrasound the same. This is Dr. Murthy in uh, University of Maryland using platforms through the HoloLens to connect ultrasound with the actual uh, VR platform and the patient. Sort of closing that circle, allowing the physician not to have to look at the ultrasound screen when the patient is right there. You can really connect the dots by using technology, in a, in a, again, in a smart way. You have medical holodeck, which is also another step forward, I think. They, they, they recreate any sort of real patient study and put it on a VR headset. In this case, it's the HTC. And I tell you, we never looked at radiology studies this way before. Even on a, on a 3D reconstruction, we can then uh, look in a 2D screen at 3D reconstructions we could never do it this way. And again, it still takes a viewer, it still takes a, the viewer to be tethered with cables to a computer or to a backpack, so it's not ideal. But we are certainly getting there, okay? You have Medivis, which is based in New York. It's a nurse surgeon, Osama Chowdhury. He's a nurse surgeon, or nurse surgeon resident, I believe, almost done with his career, and he developed this platform. I put the HoloLens on, I was looking at MRIs, and I could not believe the quality is, is better than looking at an MRI at a computer because you can have not the axial or the coronal or the sagittal. You can make your own axis any way you want to look at this. Imagine the mental map that you can form in your brain before you tackle that patient's head in this case. So the problem is, the holy grail of this is how do you connect that virtual construct to the real human anatomy, to the real patient. And that's still not solved. Although some people have said, you know, the first holographic surgery, the first uh, a, a, a HoloLens surgery, the first virtual reality surgery, it's not done yet. You cannot superimpose that digital construct to a patient's anatomy and have the precision, the accuracy, to be able to cut by looking, especially in the brain, right? A, a, by looking at an image a, a, in, a, in a headset. It's not, but we are getting there, and within a couple of years, we will be there, and it'll be really a, a true evolution, a true revolution. So he's not the only one. There are other people. This is uh, the people from uh, Apocalypse in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Germany. Again, using the HoloLens. I don't know why the surgeons, you know, they, they don't put the HoloLens on before they scrub. They always have someone, you know, put the HoloLens in their heads before they, in every video is that way. So they actually created a construct in there, and they, they can bring that cube inside the patients and have markers on the actual anatomic model in the actual patient and then really, really get it almost right with millimetric precision. But it's not there yet. I mean, not there where you would agree to have someone cutting your head just looking at the HoloLens, you know? It's, it's not there yet, but again, we will certainly get there. I have no doubt about that. It's a little complex, but not difficult to understand because we already can connect the digital to the human in a computer interface. We've been using that in orthopedics and neurosurgery surgery for years. Scopies, uh, it's a system by Stryker is doing that, but, but not with a viewer, not with a portable viewer device like the HoloLens or else. Okay? This is the first holographic surgery done in, in France not too long ago. And I guess they, they, they did it, I'm, I'm not connected with them. I don't know exactly how they did it or what they did, but it's sort of the first holographic or HoloLens, uh, a, a, a clinically used HoloLens during surgery. And uh, it's pretty amazing how they can really render the images. And I guess it's, it's just a way to view the images while you operate rather than superimposing them in the anatomy. So it's done now in a phone. This is Animaris with the iPhone a, 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 a 10 and uh, with the iOS 11 and now with the R-Core and AR-Kit. You know, they can do this, this rendering of uh, the anatomic uh, 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 images just in your phone, just like you would do in a very expensive 
3500 headset. And that is pretty amazing because that will sort of democratize access to all these technologies in a way that we didn't have it before. We have surgical theater there. And surgical theater is amazing. It's like a, like a fantastic voyage of sorts inside the patient's brain in this case. But not just the physician learning, the surgeon learning, but the patient and his family, her family learning about what better way to obtain consent permission to do something than bring the patient into the real operation and the patient walk into the actual tumor that is going to be cut by the surgeon in just, you know, in just uh, the near future. So it is really pretty, pretty amazing potential. And talking about the health crisis, the global health crisis, which is amazing. You know, we know 5 billion people is the number that, that is uh, floating around. 5 billion people using systems that are really in the prehistory in a way, you know, technologically speaking. You know, 5 billion people in lack of good, you know, a ideal a surgical care, that is a real problem. And I think these technologies can certainly help. Can certainly help, uh, help surgeons doing surgeries in tents, in war zones, in refugee camps. This is, you know, in the country with the, with the largest oil, crude oil reserves in the world, Venezuela. This is, you know, healthcare, public health in Venezuela. Look at that. So how do you help those, those countries, those doctors, those patients with technology? Well, we still have a long way to go. You know, uh, rural medicine is what, what I do in, in most cases because I live in Maine. And uh, Proximi is a company that is breaking the barriers. They're based in, uh, in the UK. And this is a system worth looking, you know, Proximi AR. They connect remote surgeons in need for expertise to expert surgeons anywhere in the world, as long as there's a connection, a, 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 a infrastructure for connectivity, for, for, for internet, then you basically have a simple screen where the surgeon expert is sitting with a camera and the surgeon's hands are then brought to augmented reality viewing on a screen in the remote rural area. And the surgeon's hands can guide the local surgeon with their actual hand, as if they were there with this augmented reality system. It's really pretty, pretty amazing. So it takes imagination, but imagination is what we all have plenty of, right? Uh, I want to show Nomadec, which is a company in France. And Nomadec is bringing the HoloLens to a whole new level. For the uh, EMS or emergency crews to be able to connect with the patient by wearing wearables, the wearable data is brought up to the actual HoloLens, and that is connected remotely to an expert or to the ED, and they can just, this is, I, I wish I had time to show you this, because you can bring the actual patient hologram up and just draw, point, go to, through checklist, all what the paramedics normally do in paper, but hands-free, voice activated, being able to bring all that data and send all that data to the actual emergency room team or trauma team waiting for that particular patient, improving the readiness, improving the, 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 the outcome. So I really think that that is really something that is going to change the world. And lastly, this is, you know, a company called uh, Iethos with a Thrive system using avatars or virtual reality avatars for doing telemedicine or teleconferencing, bringing avatars situated geographically in different areas through HoloLens into a virtual room, and the avatars can all interact with the actual digital uh, EMR in the room. So imagine the power of that, where you can see an avatar, which looks pretty, pretty avatar like the movie now, but you know, this is gonna be better, a real human looking or the same exact replica of a, of a person's avatar. And then you're talking to that guy, not on a screen, no voice, no video, but with avatar, which is moving in sort of a natural way. That has the potential to really make that interaction, that connectivity much, much better, I think. And like I said before, ARKit and ARCore are revolutionizing the way we, we do play with augmented and with, with virtual reality, because things that are coming are unreal. You know, Inside Heart created this uh, platform for, for the ARCore the, for the phone. A and I tell you, you feel the haptic, the heart beating in your hand. I tried this in the OR, one of the nights where, where the OR was uh, quite, uh, quiet, and, uh, and it was just amazing. It's an augmented reality hologram, and you can feel the beat, and you can get inside the heart, 
And you can see the blood flow. And uh, not only that, you can see the turbulence. If you go into atrial fibrillation, you can see the turbulence. So imagine how you can explain to the patient much better that they need to take antiplatelets because they're going to get turbulent flow and they're going to form a clot that is going to go to the brain and give them a stroke. You know, fantastic potential. And we're getting to the next step, which is building an inside body. You know, the hollow, the, the inside lung to teach people about their physiology and the physiopathology or the inside brain and pair this with wearables like breathing rate wearables like Spire or with a choose muse and have a portable EEG tracing on that brain in your phone, in your pocket, you know, for almost for free. You know, this is really, really fantastic. The technology is getting us there, but it's not the technology, it's the smart use of the technology. It's how we really use the technology, playing a silly game or doing something that potentially can save a life. Technology to make us, you know, better humans. Technology to really give us better health care, better humane care in a way. So I think I'm going to leave it here with this beautiful MRI of mother and baby, and uh, it's really an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you.